Today, we are talking about luxury and what that actually means in 2023. How to create a luxury brand, even if you don't have multi-million dollar properties, and how to make them stand out in a crowded market. I'm talking with Dr. Rachel Gainsbrew from Short Term Gems. She's the owner and manager of 18 luxury short term rentals, and she's going to be sharing the new definition of luxury and how we can incorporate it into our businesses. This is the Vacation Rental Success Podcast, keeping you up to date with news, views, information and resources on this rapidly changing short term rental business. I'm your host, Heather Bayer, and with 25 years of experience in this industry, I'm making sure you know what's hot, what's not, what's new, and what will help make your business a success. Well, hello. And welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast. This is your host, Heather Bayer. And as ever, super delighted to be back with you once again. And if you're listening to this on the day of publication, I'm probably airborne at the moment. I'll be flying back from the UK after a short two-week trip. Well, it's a two-week trip, whether it was short or not, I'm not sure. But it was a two-week trip, visiting family in the UK and Germany and spending time networking and presenting at the short stay week in Barcelona. So I'll be reporting back next week with my best takeaways from that event. And I'll also be sharing my experiences from the four short-term rentals I stayed in during the trip. So you do not want to miss out on next week's show. So none of those properties I stayed in claimed to be luxury, but this is a term we are hearing more and more. So I wanted to explore the definition of luxury, what it actually means now and has it changed since we thought of it as something perhaps out of our reach. We, you know, we use the term in so many different ways at very different price points. You know, for example, a hot bath, you know, when I get back, I'll have been in the air, well, I've been airports and in the air for 10 hours. I want a hot bath and that's going to feel luxurious with a simple addition of some bubbles. You know, that was three or four dollars for the bottle of bubble bath. It would have been a luxury if I'd flown first class in the seven flights I've taken over the past two weeks. However, I also consider it a luxury to use my Nexus or global entry card if we're in the US to beat the crowds when I arrive at Toronto Airport. So I Googled what does luxury mean to people and I got some surprising results. And I'm going to be talking to my guest about those results in this episode because the original definition has taken on a new meaning. You know, traditionally it was something that's an indulgence rather than a necess necessity. Some of the synonyms for luxury are words like lavish, expensive, sumptuous. Not really that relevant, I don't think, in today's world. So let's bring in Dr. Rachel Gainsbrough to share her ideas on the concept of luxury in today's short-term rental world. Rachel describes herself as a healthcare professional by day and a short-term rental investor by night. She owns and manages 18 luxury properties and is a sought-after consultant by those who want to follow her lead and invest in homes that they can then assign a luxury brand. So without further ado, let's go on over to my interview with Rachel, where we talk about all things luxury. So I'm super excited to have with me today, Dr. Rachel Gainsbrough from Short Term Gems. And we're going to be talking about luxury because I've been binging a little bit on Rachel's podcast and she's been on a ton of other podcasts and I'm crazy surprised that I haven't had you on the show before now because you've been on everybody else's so thank you for thank you for saving me to last <laughs> thank you for having me Heather and I just so appreciate all of the content that you have put out there over the years just some very helpful 
heartwarming content. You're a household name. So for me, it's such an honor. I'm sitting with a celebrity. So massive <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm the one that just I'm the one that just sits here and listens to people and just gets I I just get so much amazing quality of information from everybody I speak to. And I know having done a little bit of binging on your podcasts that I'm going to get the same from you. So um, particularly in this area that we're going to be touching on, which is the luxury market. So I said a little bit about you in the introduction, but I'd like to give you the opportunity to, to tell us about how you started in your investment journey and where it's taken you because you've come a long way in a few short years. You know, I've been doing this since 1998 and I don't think I'm as a, a far along as you are now. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, so it's been quite a journey, Heather, to be honest with you. So with healthcare, having massive shifts over the past several years, um, me and many other medical providers in the U.S. are looking for a way really to cut back a bit on the W-2 and get into something that not only can generate us some revenue so that we can cut back on our hours a little bit, but something that we can enjoy as well. And so I went all in on short-term rentals in particular because I felt as though it checked at least two of those boxes that I had formulated in my life. I wanted uh, some a little bit of time freedom. I wanted an asset that I can potentially enjoy with my family from time to time. Uh, location independence is something that, you know, we explore with as well. And for me, real estate investing, specifically luxury short-term real estate investing, falls squarely in the middle of all of that. And so within uh, a few years, three years or so, we went all in on our first property and we quickly uh, scaled to our second and we purchased our third. And the rest is history, really. And so just being in the right rooms, being mm. connected to the right people, the opportunities continued to make their way. And, you know, where it made sense, we said yes. How many properties do you have under ownership and management now? Right now, there's a total of 22 properties, nine of which are under ownership. We actually leverage a lease to lease model, like let to let for a few of them, uh, about four of them or so, and then the rest are under management. Wow. And is this mostly on Airbnb and in, in a co-hosting arrangement? Yes, it is mostly under Airbnb. Uh, however, we do leverage a strategy where we have medium term rentals and quite a few of them have gone direct booking. So they're there on Airbnb, but not leveraged, mm -hmm. you know, significantly on Airbnb. You mentioned a couple of times luxury, and that's what we're talking about. I was mentioning in the introduction that luxury to me was, you know, a hot bath after a long walk with the dog. Um, but it, it, it took me back to 25 years ago when I first started in this business and or, or first started, in fact, using vacation rentals. And what people considered luxury then, particularly in our Ontario market, was having a roof over their head. <laughs> they, they'd spent the time, you know, they'd spent previous vacations camping. So they camped because there really wasn't much else. And then they took their first vacation in a short-term rental cottage and experienced having a vacation with a roof over their head, a little TV in the corner with the rabbit's ears. Now, I'm sure that there's so many people who've <laughs> never envisaged that, you know, the sort of TV that you can't sit in an armchair and operate from. <laughs> but that was luxury. Having linens on the bed was luxury. Having a fry pan at all, let alone, you know, a decent one, that was luxury. And I know that, that it's not quite what we're going to be talking about today because the whole concept of short-term rentals has changed so radically in the past 25 years, obviously. Yeah. But it's changing even more now. And what was considered to be luxury five years ago is not the same today. So how would you say luxury has changed? Actually speaks into something that just popped in my head uh, Heather, and this is, I think, where I really got my start. I remember staying at a short-term rental in a remote town in Florida by a little fisherman's cabin area. And it was quaint. It was absolutely lovely. But I thought to myself, huh, 
I think I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's where the seed was planted. I know this is not the direction we were going, but it just it just popped up in my head. I have I've never mentioned this before, but that's where the seed was planted. Like, oh, there are dishes here. Okay, I I know where I can get some dishes. There are sheets. I know where I can get some sheets, and I I, I feel like I think I can do this, and I think I can do it even a little bit better. And so that's where the seed was planted for sure. But there has been a transition. So when we think of luxury, you know, I, I mentioned to you a little bit earlier, lifestyle of the rich and famous. We see the gold toilets, just the <laughs> opulence, and it's gaudy and it's luxurious and I, let, I like to say this isn't your grandmother's luxury okay <laughs> and I used to watch that show and just thoroughly enjoyed it as a little girl but modern luxury is different from traditional luxury where you're accumulating all of these things and choxies and it's mm. just dripping with opulence and it's almost a bit cluttered, so to speak, right? And so ever since the Industrial Revolution, now that we have transport and transit, you know, if you purchase something, Heather, on Amazon, I can purchase the same and have it within a couple of days of each other. That removes the scarcity and the feeling of, oh, well, you you have status, more status than I do. So that is no longer a barometer or metric by which a luxury is really measured. The modern luxury traveler is looking to accumulate not things, but rather experiences. They want to accumulate unique experiences. They're interested in living like a local. They're interested with reconnecting with uh, their the party that they're traveling with, whether it's a partner, loved ones, a team. So they're looking to reconnect with um, their party and they want to reconnect with nature. And so what I have is my three C's of luxury, which is connection, communication, and convenience. And so those are the things, if we can check those box, uh, we're very well on our way to creating, curating a luxury experience for our guests. I love that. Loved your story in particular about Florida. Let's, let's just step back to that because <laughs> that absolutely mirrors my origin story. And I came out, I came out from UK to Canada in 1998 and stayed in this, this old cabin, which had, it, it did have running water, but the septic system was backed up and there were 12 of us. And it was, oh, it, it was, it was an interesting experience, but that's how it all started. I sat out on a rock at the end of the day with my sister at the end of the stay. And, and I said, you know, this is fantastic. I didn't know it existed and we can do it a lot better. So, so that was my so that was my story 25 yeah. years ago and I loved that you were telling exactly the same one. <laughs> I love those those three C's. We're going to explore those a little bit more, but I just want to interject with a article I read in Forbes just a couple of days ago. And it was about this exact thing. It was about how the old definitions of luxury don't apply and they're not relevant for consumers anymore. Just as you said, you know, it's not our, it's not our grandma's stuff anymore. He calls his the three T's and calls it a new and expanded definition of luxury. And his are, and I'm sure we can, you know, there's, there's huge similarities. His are time, truth and trust. And he says, when you give consumers an experience that saves them time, which sounds like your convenience, yeah. gives them what they want that's particular to them and information from that they trust from a source they want to associate with, which is, of course, you know, you're sort of living like a local in the connection. Then you've created a luxury experience from them. So it's very interesting to, to hear your three C's against Wiener's three T's. They're not much different, but they're, they're, they are committing us to looking at luxury with a you know, from a completely different angle. You mentioned relationship as well. I, I heard it in a podcast. You were, you were talking about relationship as being a, as a component of a luxury short-term rental. Can you expand on that a little? Well, it really is encompassed, I believe, with the communication piece of it. So understanding the purpose of that visit, some guests are visiting for a wedding celebration. Some guests are visiting in order to get respite from, say, a death in the family, unfortunately, there are a 
there are a variety of reasons that we host our guests in our properties. And understanding the purpose of that visit can change the tonality on the communication. Understanding who uh, is going to be a part of that party could really help us to curate a more informed uh, stay where we are serving where we're serving those guests in the right way. So say it's a wedding, it's going to be more of a celebratory type of communication. You know, the flowers may be different, you know? And so uh, continuing that uh, communication with them along the way, not only as they're traveling to the property, because for, for this type of traveler, again, the luxury traveler is not just the destination is the whole journey and the life cycle of the journey as they're looking at the listing, whether they're looking on a direct booking platform or on an OTA, they're looking at that listing, what is being communicated to them. And along the way, as they're getting there, are we providing them information so that they're informed as to what's available in the area for them to leverage mm -hmm. and take advantage of. And additionally, you know, throughout the check-in, uh, make sure they're settled in, uh, you know, check out. And then afterwards, we want to continue on that communication to get them to visit us again, whether it's for a wedding anniversary after that wedding. Can we, uh, you know, document somewhere that this was the purpose and we can celebrate that with them uh, in, in a future date? So all of that is a part of the relationship. I think that's a little bit of what I was referring mm -hmm. to Heather, but correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's, that's, you know, yeah, that, that really makes so much sense. I'm just come back from a couple of weeks in Europe, four stays in four separate vacation rentals. And four times I heard nothing between booking and the stay. So getting there, there was no relationship, no relationship with any of these hosts or managers, no information. And, you know, I went to, uh, to Barcelona for short stay week. And I've never, I have been to Barcelona once before, but it was years ago and it was for a conference and it was a fleeting visit. Now I would have loved more information just fed to me over a period, you know, how I'm, I'm going to be on my own. You know, I'm visiting a city on my own. I've got to arrive, got to go find the apartment, got to find places to eat. And I, I could have spent, you know, three days inside the apartment thinking, where do I go to eat? Because I'm on my own and I don't know where to go. And nothing was, was given. Stayed in a small cottage in um, Cornwall in England. Mm -hmm. And this little village called Port Isaac is mm -hmm. really well renowned because it's, it was the basis for a TV show that went on for years and years on the BBC. And it was a fictional, fictional show, in fact, about a doctor. And... <laughs> I didn't choose it for this. I had no idea that that this was the you know the, the place where this TV show was filmed. There was so much opportunity for this host to give me all this information and to say, you know, if you want Sunday lunch at the local pub, which is featured in this show, you need to book well in advance. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Everything you said, I think is great. You know, you've got to have that relationship and that there is a luxury element in there. So this sort of comes on to my next question because I'm very strong on avatars, on knowing who your guests are. So tell me how important you believe it is to define your guest avatar and then speak directly to them. Oh, I love this question, Heather. And I do want to touch on something really quick. Everything you mentioned a little bit earlier, and I hope the listeners are really taking note, none of this would break the bank. When people think <laughs> of luxury, they're, they're thinking, oh, it's going to be this really expensive investment. But it takes time to put together some guidance for your guests, but it doesn't have to cost millions and millions of dollars. And what a missed opportunity indeed, right? And so these are opportunities that would pay back dividends, but they missed out. And again, it doesn't have to break the bank. So, yeah. So to answer your questions about avatars, oh, I am all in on avatars. <laughs> My avatar, her name is Susan. She's married to Martin and they have four kids. <laughs> They're in what's called that sandwich generation, where they are caring for children, but they're caring for parents, elderly <laughs> parents as well. It sounds familiar. That's like, <laughs> so she loves to travel when she can. She works the nine to five, you know, both 
uh, her and her husband, they both work a nine to five. And uh, when they travel, they're typically traveling with their siblings, adult siblings, and their spouses, plus their children, plus parents, and a random one or two cousin that <laughs> makes their way in only during vacation planning time. And so my avatar typically is looking for a larger home that's a little bit off the beaten path somewhere. There's a, a yard, there's an area for gaming for children. There are, you know, spaces in the property or on site where they can uh, connect, you know, and gather together in spaces where they can go and retreat and hide away <laughs> from time to time. And so, yeah, so I am a firm believer in that avatar. And we have really leaned into that because I would call it really our specialization mm -hmm. whenever we're looking for property, whether it's to onboard for ourselves or to manage for another investor, we like to stick to that same type of property that would fit the needs of that avatar because we know them so well. We have our, our operations dialed in for that avatar. We can speak to them in our copy and our marketing. And, and yeah, so I'm a firm believer. That is one of the very first <laughs> things that I do, whether it's um, an avatar for uh, a guest that's coming to see me or even an investor avatar. There's some <laughs> investor I just won't work with, either, you know? <laughs> so I create an avatar for the investor. I create so many <laughs> avatars for, I create a house avatar, you know, will this fit, you know, our, our needs and what we're looking for, <laughs> for our guests. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm all about Avatar. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I, I don't think we can stress this part of it more strongly because, uh, you know, if, if you don't have an Avatar when you're marketing, you're, you're, what you're doing is, and I came, across the, I came across this the other day, it's called Spray and Pray, the Spray and Pray <laughs> Approach. <laughs> I've heard of it. That's so funny. I mean, I, I talked about it in a, in a presentation recently, and I call it the sore strategy, the spaghetti against a wall <laughs> strategy. Yes. You know, it, it yeah. means when you, you don't have an avatar, you're just spraying everything out and hoping that some of it's going to stick yeah. and, and praying that somebody's going to find it. But with an yeah. avatar, of course, because you're talking directly to that person, you're, you're laser focused Mm -hmm. on them. I love your avatar. That is because you've given her a name. She's, she's got a family. She's, you know, this person. Talk to me about doing this because I know people will say, well, you know, this is very specific. This is, this is, you know, th there's so many people out there who aren't, who don't have four kids, who don't travel with their siblings and their parents. Aren't I missing out on all these other people? And it's 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 a a well known argument against targeting too tightly to a niche. What what would what do you say to that? Yeah, and Heather, I'm glad you're asking that question because I was that person as well. I had that mindset of I want to you know everyone's welcome, everyone join me, you know. So it, it didn't start off this way where I got it dialed in. I started off wanting to cater to everyone, right? And so what you learn in business, especially if you're looking out for the best interests of your business, what you learn is that when you're catering to everyone, really you're catering to no one. And what happens is the message gets diluted. Now, if a, a group of men requests to book my property for an executive retreat, am I going to decline them? Well, absolutely not. They would still find benefit, you know, in, in our particular property. So for those who are just starting out, I would say, yes, spraying and praying or spaghetti on the wall. Uh, that's where I started. That's where a few of us have started. Right. But once you start to identify, you know what, I've, I've had some of the best experiences working with these one or two types of avatar, go in on that. Get laser focused on that avatar so that you can start to attract more and more of that kind of guest. And so I think it's it's a um, a sustainable model 
to create your avatar, you know, it's sustainable. You get to really serve and work with those that you have enjoyed working with over and over again because you're catering to them. And so I would remove kind of the scarcity mindset. <laughs> it's more of a scarcity mindset of, you know, I don't want to just focus on this one person. What about everyone else? Sometimes it's from that vantage point, but sometimes it's, I don't want to focus on everyone, uh, just one, because I'm missing out on <laughs> everyone else. That that could be in the back of our minds too, especially, you know, as we're trying to make sure that the business continues to generate revenue. But I encourage you, if you really go all in on your avatar, you will attract others too, who may have the same, you know, values, although they may be there for another purpose they will keep you in mind if they fall into that specific <laughs> avatar and they're visiting again. So it has served us well, for sure, focusing on that avatar because Heather, we continue to attract them. So we're speaking to them specifically and we get more and more and more of the type of guests that we want to visit our property. We don't necessarily want everyone yeah. to visit our property. It's not a good fit for everyone. You know, we wouldn't enjoy having them and they would enjoy us at, as well. You know, just it's not a good match. So if you want to make sure that your property is, you know, matched correctly with the right um, guests, just focus on that one avatar. And if there's a season where, for instance, we have a few markets where it's more of a slower season where we're catering to the moonlighters, not the moonlighters, the snowbirds All right. <laughs> uh, that are coming in, moonlighters. I'm thinking of the hospital. That's what we do like when we work extra, it's called moonlighting. The snowbirds, you can switch up your listing to make sure that during the period where mm -hmm. they're going to be booking, you can, you know, update it for that specific avatar. I, I love the fact that you, you say, you know, you've got plenty of avatars because I think that's important mm -hmm. to say, you know, you don't have to have just one. And you also mentioned, of course, as a property manager, you've got to have your owner avatars too. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, we had one called the Ram the Ram avatar because Ram stood for run a mile. <laughs> you mentioned that one, you know, you can see them coming. So we had this description of this, this, this one who's, you know, who, who said, who says in their correspondence that, you know, don't, don't forget you're just one of many. Oof. You're, you're just one of many property managers that I'm looking at. So make sure you come armed with, uh, with all the deals you're going to give me. It's like, okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll pass on this one. <laughs> Immediately passed. Yes, Immediately yes that, that was our, yeah. our RAM owner. But wow. yes, you know, plenty of, <laughs> plenty of avatars to help you direct everything. Coming back onto, onto luxury accommodation, anybody, I, I believe that anyone with whatever property they have can create a luxury experience. And I'm sure you feel exactly the same. But let's be really practical. And what sort of features or amenities can, you know, style a property as a luxury brand? Mm, I love that question. And I do, I do agree with you that anyone could curate a luxury stay. My one caveat that I've <laughs> identified is if you're in like a dodgy side of town, a very dangerous, it's going to be difficult to market it as a luxury stay, you know, without putting out some full disclosures as well. Like, okay, this is, this side of town is a little bit tough. If you're not used to seeing, you know, people on the streets all hours of the night, this might not be a good fit for you. So some people with a, more of a meek disposition, I'm from like the inner city of Miami where it's really <laughs> dodgy. So I, I can, I can handle myself, but some people are like, Oh my goodness, my life, you know, is in danger. And so you definitely want to caveat that if you're, you know, looking to host in, in that type of area, but as far as features, you know, it really, it really depends on the guest. So if it is a, a guest that is going to be staying in your space for say a number of days, a week or so, you want to make sure that the kitchen cooking tools and the kitchen amenities are very much higher quality than if it's, you know, just a one night overnight stay, right? So you want to make sure that mm -hmm. it's really good quality. And one of my favorite amenities to add to the kitchen is the Vitamix blender. <laughs> You're right on my wavelength on this one. <laughs> oh yeah. I love a Vitamix blender. You know, our guests, they rave about it. It's it's not something that's seen very often mm -hmm. in our market. So it, it kind of puts that little feather in your cap that you elevated uh, their stay with such a 
such a high end blender. And so you don't have to get the the extreme top of the line, but to have something of that quality and that caliber in the kitchen, it really, um, you know, it's memorable to them. And again, high quality cooking tools, but within the bedrooms, I mean, if we, we can take a tour of the property, we go mm -hmm. into the bedrooms, the king size bed is the default luxury travel bed. Okay. So imagine your guests sprawling out like the king or the queen that they are. That king size bed really is, is something that is sought after. And it's something that we try to implement in multiple rooms in our properties if we can swing it. But sometimes you do have a, a square footage limitation <laughs> where you cannot. But we, we absolutely love adding a king size bed. Uh, multiple options for coffee. So whether it's adding a you have the the unit dose like a Keurig, you have a, a usual drip uh, coffee with the canister and adding a French press. I mean, it's not difficult to add the French press as well. And so that has received some great comments as an extra special touch as well. And being a coffee person, you know, <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> the options. But as you go through the property, I do love um, providing options of eco friendly toiletries in the bathrooms. I love that. Natural fiber linens is another, you know, practical thing that we add to our our um, properties. Whether it's a uh, bamboo sheets or uh, cotton, I know it takes a little bit longer to dry for cotton, whatever that may be. But natural fiber linens, I think of whatever touches the guests skin should be nice and soft because my goal is to address all of all five senses. What are they smelling? What are they feeling? What are they seeing? You know, what are they tasting? So I want to address all, all five senses and that's a part of the practical side of it for me. I love that you, uh, you address the senses. I've talked about that for years, you know, that the, when you arrive at a property, open the door, you've got to be hit the first, you know, those, those five senses, you've got to have the visual you've got. To, and I've always said auditory. And we always had music playing when our guests arrived and the luxury is actually finding out what the guests preference are and having their preference playing. We, we found that that was, uh, that, that was a shock for many. And <laughs> then they realized that why we'd ask them, you know, in, in, in the, in that relationship building, which is all part of it, why we'd ask them, you know, what music do you like? And then we had that music playing. So, you know, the visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic by those wonderful bed linens and the, the wonderful feel, the smell, the olfactory sense. That's, that's my major sense. I can smell disinfectant from a mile off. And if I walk into a rental and all I smell is disinfectant, I am not too happy. I, you know, you come from a healthcare environment, you know what that smell is like. Oh, I do. Yes. And then the, and then the fifth one, of course, gustatory taste, having something nice for them to, uh, you know, even if it's, even if it's just a very cold bottle of water, mm. <laughs> that's something. Yeah. So I, yeah, so I am, refreshing. we are really on the same wavelength here. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I love to hear that, you know, th these things that perhaps, a lot of people who've been in hospitality a long time, going back to the traditional times, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and they were very focused on hospitality. For them, they're finding out now that what they've been doing for years is now considered luxury. Mm. You know, there's, and, and that's what they can sell, what they have been sharing with their guests for so many years, which is why they've got, you know, multi-hundred five-star reviews over yeah. the years. But this is great. The, I mean, these are ideas that anybody can take on. And also, you said this earlier on, they don't have to cost much. No. And that's my favorite part about it because the misconception, right, Heather, is when we talk luxury, we're going to be opening our wallets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't necessarily have to break the bank. And so uh, investing in higher quality, yes, the linens are going to cost a little bit more, but Thankfully, they're going to last a little, a little bit longer as well, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, going the cheap Amazon route, you, mm -hmm. know, you, you invest a little <laughs> bit more and it will last longer as well. So I love it. I want to sort of move on a little bit to your properties and, you know, what it is that you actually do in your properties that make people keep coming back. And I want to talk about the one that appeared on a Netflix show. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, tell me absolutely. about that one. 
Yeah, absolutely. So that was a property that was featured because it was generating quite a bit of revenue as a medium term. And so although we weren't focused on medium term rentals, we started that one off that way because it was a bit larger than the others in the market. And we were onboarding a new cleaning team and we were going through the process of training and making sure that they were um, up to par. And so we had set it up for a medium term just for the first uh, month. And it was booked at a very high rate. We were, we were shocked and astonished. And so it continued to do well that way. And uh, the data company, AirDNA, they reached out as well as a casting company called Mystic Arts. They reached out. They said, we have a TV show based on the numbers on AirDNA. We want to feature you on a, on a show. I was like, oh, this is interesting. I'm a girl pharmacist. You know, it's like, this is nothing <laughs> that I ever imagined, you know, would be on the, uh, you know, the plan for my life. And so it was quite an interesting um, endeavor. I, we didn't think we would have been selected, my husband and I, then we were selected. Uh, then they um, did the filming on property. They flew us to Albuquerque, New Mexico to complete the filming of the show. And that was, that was an absolute blast. And so it, it's it, what, what was great about the property and the reason that I feel the guests kept coming back uh, and much like all of our properties is that we, we add extra special touches to the property. So for instance, we have local honey sticks in the coffee bar. Okay. Again, another extra touch that doesn't have to break the bank yet. It brings something local to the guest experience. We have a very popular recipe here the dry goods portion of it and broth, you just stick it in the crock pot and all of a sudden you have a local meal that you can enjoy and you, but you get a taste of what it is really to live like a local mm -hmm. in that area. So it addresses your, your taste buds. So those are some of the things, but outside of that, it's everything we spoke about, Heather. We have two king size beds. It's a six bedroom property. We have some queen size beds as well, uh, open spaces so that, you know, the group families could really enjoy and gather together. We have enough seating for everyone. We can host up to 12. Well, a little bit more than that, but we typically host around 12. <laughs> we host up to 16 potentially in this property. So two separate living rooms so that, you know, we can sequester the young ones together and they can have their gaming. And then you have another area where the elder folks can, you know, get, gather and get some respite as well. So it, it just, it's, it's something for me, it's being mindful of who's going to be joining us and making sure that we curate a space that will be a good fit. That goes, it goes back to J Jared Wiener uh, of the Future Hunters that I was talking about earlier. And one of his teas is truth. But in fact, when you read into the article, and I'll put a link to the article in the show notes. So, and, and it really is a good read. Um, but what he terms truth is really about personalization. It really is about knowing who's coming and creating this wonderful space for them. I'm sure you've come across Tyann Marsink. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tyann, great friend of mine, has this wonderful portfolio of properties that she has built in Branson, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And and I went to Branson once. It's like this amazing place with, you know, this little town with so many theaters in it, music theaters. Yeah. And live, which is interesting. And yeah. it's it's one of the, it's the biggest um, group destination, group vac vacation destination in the US. And I never knew this. So Tyann specially creates these wonderful properties that sleep up to 30 plus people. And she, she incorporates all of the things that you've been talking about and is just hugely successful at it because she knows her audience and she's speaking directly to them and creating this personalization that they love. It's so much different from the, you know, I, I'm buying a property and I'll just throw it on Airbnb and see what happens. There's a lot of thought and care and attention that goes into it. And I can see how, how you are so successful at it. Having talked about building things, buying places, let's just have a, a because you do invest in properties, start with whereabouts. Uh, we, we didn't touch on where your properties are. Yeah. So I started in my own backyard here in Georgia. So I'm a little bit south of the uh, city, Atlanta area. So Georgia, Florida, 
is where I'm from originally. So my heart goes there. <laughs> Tennessee, which is a bordering state to Georgia. So there are three together. And finally, the Poconos of Pennsylvania, which is in the <laughs> Northeast. So that's a little bit a ways off of the other properties. And so that's where we have our skiers and, you know, those who are looking for that type of experience in the Poconos. You sound, you sound very much like Tyann, because I've always said, said about her that she has more hours in the day than anybody else. So we, oh. you know, you know, we, we mere mortals have 24 hours in the day. She, she has many more. And it's, uh, if you're still running a full-time job and you're doing this with properties all over the place, what is your secret for managing all these properties in so many different locations? Yeah, so I have cut back on the full-time, but <laughs> the secret nevertheless is a team, you know, having a team who is invested in the business. And it took a lot of Kissing a lot of frogs, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you could probably relate before I can get, you know, a team that is all in, that is in alignment with everything that we spoke about, that mm -hmm. have the same heart, have the same concern, you know, for the guests. And, and it took a while to get there. And part of it is my fault, right? Because I was not a good manager in the beginning. I was not a good business owner in the beginning. I didn't take the time to really um, do the training that was necessary to get them to where they needed to be. You know, as soon as I got my first person helping, I was like, oh, great, you're here. Help. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that, yeah, that did not work out. I didn't have clear instructions, you know, expected them to read my mind, so to speak. And so it's like, oh my goodness, why are they not reading my mind? My husband's like, no one can read your mind, get over that. And so I learned, I learned um, quickly that in order to create an environment where my team members can thrive, there has to be clarity of instruction, <laughs> there has to be um, an interest in them as well. And what I love is I know so much about my team members, so much about their families and so much about their interests outside of work and outside of just monetary goals, you know, and it's unbelievable what you learn when you take a moment to ask and mm -hmm. it's beyond anything I could have ever guessed. You can't guess this. I think I asked one team member, what is it that you really want? What do you want? And it was for say, I think her spouse to go back to school and learn something about war anthropology. It's like, what? <laughs> and you don't know this stuff because that's that was his dream all along. And her goal is to create a role for herself in revenue stream so that she can support him. Mm -hmm. to do that. And that was like, whoa, I would have never in my wildest dream. And so now that I know that, if I know historians, I'll say, oh, did you see this? And did you see that? And how can I support you um, to make sure that you continue to plant seeds towards that goal? And he's getting there, you know, he's closer there than ever before because of the interest, you know, that I had in, in making sure that she felt mm -hmm. valued. And so it's, you just have to ask. So, that that's made a huge difference. And yeah, it's, it's just heartwarming to know how to hear them talk about me, you know, to others, like she really cares, like not BS care. She really cares. And it's so. Uh, I, I love to hear that. And it, it is a theme that seems to run through the most successful people in this industry and the successful property managers that they take care of their team. Their team is just amazingly special to them and that's a skill that not everybody has and it's probably and it's one that not everybody wants to have but it appears to me that for real success having that relationship with the team is so important yeah yeah it's one of the most highest leverage things that we can do if we're looking to outsource some of the tasks so that we can work yeah. on our business and not just in it all day long yeah <laughs> Rachel, this has been such a fantastic conversation. And I know, you know, we've had so much in common. That I, I would love to continue with it, but you're know, very mindful of your time. You are a mentor to new investors in this industry. You've got a huge following. You do training courses, you know, for, just, just to kick off with, I just want to ask you for some tips you can give to any investors who are, or any listeners who are keen on taking on additional properties, and then just tell us that how you help them out. 
Yeah. So what what we've noticed lately is that there's a lot of, I would say, rumors or rhetoric out there in the news that, you know, this industry is going down and that has caused a lot of alarm for investors who, who really maybe their heart wasn't all the way in it. Right? Mm-hmm. And so what we have found is reaching out to those investors and partnering with them and letting them know, hey, I'm here if you need some help to continue to make sure that this business is profitable or even if you want to sell the property or rent the property, you know, just being a support, being someone who offers value to them, I think is going to really help those who are in the industry looking to increase their portfolio. So reach out to those owners who are tired, who are tired of it, Mm -hmm. just, you know, they, they don't, they didn't know what they were getting into. You know, the revenue is not quite where they want it to be because they may not have necessarily mm-hmm. optimized and focused on their avatar. And so these are properties that you can potentially turn around just by making two or three tweaks. Uh, it can potentially make a, a, a vast improvement. So I would really recommend that. And as far as working with me, I have a number of ways that you can work with me. We have a a coaching program. We have a digital course, but I have a free resource. And if you tap into that, you'll get access to the different uh, programming that we have. We have trainings every week. So if you go to 75gems.com, that's 75gems.com. Those are my top 75 cities in the U.S. with the highest profitability for short-term rentals. You can have a look at the list, see if your city made it. If it didn't, that's okay. Don't be afraid. (laughs) You know, we can still leverage in our own backyard. So, yeah, tap in with me that way. And that's going to be the best way to get uh, keep in touch. Uh, well, I will put uh, links to everything you do in the sh- in the show notes. So mm-hmm. if anybody wants to get in touch with Rachel and and talk about investment or about turning a property around or anything else to do with being the best in this industry, I'm sure she's going to help you out. Rachel, it's been an absolute pleasure to to talk to you and as as i say to come across all these points that uh, of of common ground <laughs> that we yeah. have you know i've been in the industry for way too many years and you've come along in the past 3 or 4 years and and done everything that i did in 25 years <laughs> much quicker so i have huge admiration for you and thank you so much for joining me i appreciate you so much thank you heather for having me it's such an honor being with you today Thank you so much, Rachel Gainsborough. That was <laughs> such a great conversation. You know, so much, so much in common from the origin story through to so many of the things that she does within her company that I've been talking about for years. So it, it is great to see that this whole these whole elements of hospitality are still running through the most modern of companies and. So thank you so much, Rachel, for joining me, for sharing all that great information on the changing nature of the luxury brand. We can all be there. I love the fact she said, you know, you can't, you cannot classify your property as luxury if you're really in a not a very good environment. Unfortunately, we used to have to say this to owners within our property management company in Ontario, who who might say that, oh, I've got a luxury property. And when you went there, it was a really run down old cabin on the outside, but they'd really gone to town inside to make it look wonderful. But you've got to do it from the outside in. So the curb appeal has to be pretty darn good in order for it to uh, to be classified as as luxury. At least that's the way I see it. So, uh, as I mentioned, if you're listening to this on the day of publication, I'm on my way back from the short stay week in Barcelona, plus visits to all my family in the UK and Germany. And I've stayed at four separate short-term rental properties, two in the UK, one in Spain, one in Germany. And I'm going to share my experiences from those as a traveller in the show next week, as well as sharing my top takeaways from the short stay week in Barcelona. So I hope you will tune into that because there's going to be a lot of learning in there. Thank you for joining me.
I'm always humbled by the amount of downloads we get every week. You know, when the show goes out and I look at my stats, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this many people have downloaded this episode. I just want to take a moment to just really thank you. Thank you for listening. I appreciate every single one of you. Let me know, please, what you enjoy about the show, if there's anything you'd like me to change, if there's people that you'd like me to have on, let me know. I love to get messages and emails from people. And now I don't have a busy property management company to run. I'm actually got a little bit more time to spend getting back to you and making sure that I answer your questions and that we start communicating, get a relationship going. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And I'll be with you again next week. It's been a pleasure as ever being with you. If there's anything you'd like to comment on, then join the conversation on the show notes for the episode at vacationrentalformula.com. We'd love to hear from you. And I look forward to being with you again next week.